Welcome to the Anime Research Group, a show about the weird and wonderful mistake that is anime. I'm Ian. I'm Denny. I'm Freya. And this week we get into the Christmas spirit. No, not by watching Tokyo Godfathers, but by watching Neo Yokio Pig Christmas. Yeah, we decided, you know, anime has so few Christmas specials that are, like, good. There's really only Tokyo Godfathers you can think of. So we decided, let's go off in a bit of a different direction. If you have any suggestions that are good, feel free to send them into the email. Yes. Well, because, like, I thought canon, but canon isn't really about Christmas, but it is wintry. I guess Achi Kochi is also kind of wintry. But in terms of Christmas specials, the only pe- one that people told me on Twitter was the Love Hina Christmas special, mm. and I really didn't want to watch Love Hina. Yeah. <laughs> we'll save that for next year, unless people send us better things. Or, or, or we give up and watch Tokyo Godfathers. But everyone's telling you to watch Tokyo Godfathers right mm. now. You don't need to hear that from us as well. It's a good movie. Everybody knows that. Yeah. So it's going to be a little bit more unstructured today, a bit like uh, Halloween's Dracula episode. So it's going to be much shorter than normal, but hopefully you'll like it. So with that, Denny, tell us a bit about Neo Yokio. Yeah, I mean, in case you hadn't heard of Neo Yokio, it's a weird-ass show that came out in 2017 after several years in production. It's, I mean, we can debate on whether it's an anime or not later, but it was primarily written by uh, Westerners. It was conceptualized by them, though the majority of the pre-production happened in Japan and it was primarily animated in South Korea. So I have a lot to say about this topic, but I'm not going to say it here. And especially because, uh, for, unfortunately, Kenny Lauderdale came up with a YouTube video that says like 90% of what I would say in this circumstance. <laughs> But whether it's considered anime or not, Thunderbolt Fantasy definitely isn't an anime, and we've reviewed that, so we might as well allow <laughs> this, regardless of what we think. Yeah. This particular special was released in December 2018, about a year after the original six-episode series. Well, the original series was listed as being made by Studio Dean and Production IG. This special was uh, primarily made by Titmouse Inc. and a South Korean studio named Digital Emation. Both of them have actually worked on quite a lot of stuff. Titmouse Inc., for example, has worked on the Avatar, The Last Airbender opening sequence, seasons five through seven of Venture Bros, the Scooby-Doo and Kiss movie, because everybody's made at least one Scooby-Doo movie. They've also more recently made the new Animaniacs and that animated Star Trek show that I think people liked. They're also the ones that are making the Critical Role animated series that had like a big Kickstarter success a year ago or so. You know, this is actually like a pretty good like subset of things to have worked on. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Like I was just I was just reading the list and going like I like these things. <laughs> As for digital animation, they've been around for a bit longer since the early nineties, and they've worked on a lot of shows. So I'm just listing a few. They've worked on Totally Spies, Shaolin Showdown. They've worked on the first two seasons of Venture Bros, Gravity Falls. I think one or two seasons of Family Guy, The Cleveland Show, and on that uh, new Harley Quinn series. Ugh, the Cleveland show. <laughs> Specifically, this uh, show was a creation of Ezra Kerning, who's like the frontman of a band called Vampire Weekend. Not something I'd ever heard of before, but what do I know about music? You may remember them playing at a Bernie Sanders uh, event this year in the before time. I read a bunch of interviews with Kerning and Jaden Smith, and he said that one of the show's primary inspirations was Tokyo Babylon the clamp series he describes the first episode of the six episode series as tokyo babylon meets jeeves and booster which i'm not actually sure what that is uh, it's a it's a hugh laurie and um stephen fry comedy and what is it about a butler oh well, right? I, I guess that works with charles Kerning further stated that he really wanted to see new york in an anime style and talks about how he watched mad bull 34 as a child and it making an impact on him Mad Bull 34, in case you don't remember, is the OVA about a giant police officer who straps grenades to his penis. Yeah, that was the thing. He should have waited for the Love Live movie, which is set in New York. <laughs> I mean, we'll talk about the reception of this show later, but one, I just one quote I want to give you is that we put all of our budget into hiring Furuhashi to do the boards and stuff. We couldn't, afford, we couldn't really afford to have a writer's room. So they specifically wanted to hire one specific uh, one director, and they really ran out of money. I mean, it's understandable that presenting this studio, this project to a studio, they wouldn't necessarily throw the biggest funding at it. I think it seems to me that they spent a lot of money on the uh, voice talent, <laughs> uh, so to speak. Um, so 
maybe they shouldn't have done that. Uh, well, I feel they came out the voice talent to just ask Jaden Smith's dad to call all of his friends. Do you know that for sure? I have no idea. Is Will, is Will Smith friends with Susan Sarandon? I don't know. He could be. Who are you to say they don't have brunch together every week? It's entirely possible they do. I just don't. Cons- I just don't think it's likely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, this show is stuffed with voice acting talent. Like they've got. Jude Law, Susan Sarandon, Jason Schwartzman, okay, Richard Ayoade. Okay, 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 okay. Let me rephrase the, your, what you just said. They have lots of acting talent. Yes. Whether they, whether, whether they have voice acting talent is a little bit more debatable. Steve, Steve Buscemi, Stephen Fry. They've got a lot of people in here. Most of whom aren't in this special. Yeah, but as long as they had Richard Ayoade, because it is really <laughs> all about the mm-hmm. uh, sales clerk anyway. True, true. And so on that part, I guess I should briefly describe what happens in this show. Um, basically, it's Christmas and Kaz wants a nice Christmas story. And he's getting his mecha butler, Charles, to read to him. And this acts as the framing device for a story about Kaz because he's a massive narcissist. Set in current day neo Yokio, which is... New York, but with demons in it. And also slightly underwater. It, it's it's a it's a alternate world New York where the two towers haven't been destroyed and demons invade. Yeah, that sounds about right. Part of the story is about Kaz, and the other part, but the a good part of this beginning is about this sales clerk called Herbert, who was like a recurring side character in the series, who is just amazing. But he's a very aristocracy worshiping guy who works <laughs> in a department store. It's a farm boy. Yeah, he's obsessed with all of like the most eligible bachelors in town and field hockey and all the other like really upper class pursuits of the town. To be fair, the New York does have a giant board in Times Square that lists the top 10 eligible bachelors of the city. Our protagonist, Kaz Khan, being number two. Yeah, so he's he's not the, he's not the most ridiculous person in this show, but kind of is. So he has been tasked somewhat accidentally by Kaz with purchasing a secret Santa gift for his arch rival, Arcangelo Corelli, mm-hmm. um, for this big televised event where they have a secret Santa between all the most eligible bachelors, and this is entertaining to the populace somehow. I mean, you know if this was on real TV, people would be turning in, in masses to watch this. I guess so. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, it's basically just a giant unboxing video starring a bunch of popular celebrities in their universe. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. It's a sh- it's a shared unboxing video between the ten most popular celebrities in town. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It, this 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 would go nuts. <laughs> so he goes around town. He tries like all the fanciest places because he works in the fancy department store. He knows where to go, and eventually settles on a fancy uh, pocket watch that would have been owned by uh, Arcangelo's great 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 grandfather hmm. and can also apparently tell when demons are around. And Kaz happens to be a magistocrat which is essentially demon hunters who are also called rat catchers and that's like a recurring plot in both this and the series that he constantly gets hired out by his aunt Agatha played by Susan Sarandon to go around and deal with demon troubles in the city. So, so after he gets Kaz this gift uh, we move on to the event where they're giving each other these gifts, but Arcangelo has decided to one-up everyone by appropriating anti-consumerist messaging <laughs> about the about the spirit of Christmas. Fuck materialism! Fuck materialism! <laughs> in order to convince people to buy tickets to his Christmas spectacular <laughs> idol show, basically. And promote his podcast. Uh, of course. And unfortunately, this takes off in the, to the confusion of Kaz, who is the most materialistic person in the show, with mm. the possible exception of his aunt. And unfortunately for Herbert, he ends up getting laid off from Bergdorf because the anti consumer message means that he can no longer they can no longer afford to pay him to keep working there. And I think that also gives us the single best line in the entire uh, special, which is, I would hate for my salary to jeopardize your profit margins. That's just <laughs> peak commentary. And this is when he gets consumed by the great demon who is using him to destroy the city and the rich people who treated him like shit. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Kaz has to go and provide uh, security support to Arcangelo's Christmas Spectacular 
uh, during which we are forced to listen to Jaden Smith rapping. <laughs> before eventually the whole thing gets resolved sort of by Kaz chasing down Herbert and engaging in a climactic battle. Or at least that's what should have happened. It turns out his aunt will do the fighting for him. And then the city gets destroyed. The end. Or is it? Great story. Uh, Like, I've seen worse. (laughs) Like, we've all seen Mars of Destruction. We've We've all seen Skelter Heaven. Yeah, it is a refreshing uh, outcome for the quest for the answer to the question of how do we deal with capitalism to be we simply kill everybody and destroy civilization. That's not a refreshing answer. <laughs> it's it's an unusual answer. I, I, it's not refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> That's what a certain segment of the uh, Christian populace in America thinks is the solution to capitalism. The rapture. Shout out to accelerationism. <laughs> uh, so, I guess the first thing we should me- we should probably talk about is like how we think this functions as a Christmas show and about Christmas and anime more generally. Uh, one thing that's very apparent from the lack of Christmas anime is that Japan doesn't really care for Christmas. Who would have known? It's the KFC day. I mean, the way they care about Christmas is it gets one or two chapters dedicated to it, maybe where they worry about buying Christmas gifts. You, you can get a Christmas episodes, but there's nothing really centered around Christmas. Tokyo Godfather is probably the only thing. They also use it to uh, give people Santa outfits in video games. Well, I mean, we all like a good Santa outfit, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, what we see in like particularly romantic shows, it's often be like, oh, this is like the romance holiday where you get together with your sweetheart and New Year's is when you get together with your family. Like this is the date where you confess. This is like the big confession moment. But what about White Day? But what about White Day indeed? Which is, I guess, why it should be no surprise that when we've got a story that is being written, at least by Westerners, that this is when we get our Christmas shows. <laughs> <laughs> True, true. Because every because every cartoon gets its Christmas episode. They did a decent job of incorporating just all the traditional Christmas elements. Christmas mm-hmm. dinner, getting together with the family is like we see his aunt Angelique come in, who is the black twin sister of his aunt Agatha, played by Susan Sarandon, who is a white character, for reasons that are not explained. But I guess that could probably happen. I'm not a biologist. We have all the Christmas decorations, obviously. We have the tree that he fights uh, in the middle of the ice skating rink. There are some weird little differences that the fact, like the fact that they eat a goose instead of a turkey. Mm-hmm. Well, a goose would be a goose would be a very traditional thing to do. Like a turkey is like a much more modern thing. Like if you think back okay. to like a Christmas Carol, it's always it's, it was always yes. a Christmas goose. Yes. We also have all the Christmas music remixes. We have. Well, we, we don't have an ugly sweater party. We have a fresh take on an, on an old classic, a beautiful Christmas sweater party. Christmas sweater slash drug party. Yes, where they snort demons. That, that was really confusing, because I was like, okay, like, the city is literally being attacked by demons constantly, or otherwise they wouldn't need the Magistocrats. But yet, yeah, people have just somehow gotten a hold of a demon to turn it into well, demon cocaine. Maybe, they're, <laughs> maybe they took all the dead demons and... <laughs> it does, it's recycling. It I mean, we've, we've also included Christmas shopping, which is cancelled this year because Archangelo said so, and that then eventually leads to Herbert's suicide attempt, where after he gets fired by his VTuber boss, uh, Bergdorf-chan, he's about to jump off the roof, just in the spirit of Christmas. I love Bergdorf Chan. I, I mean, I was a little, I would, I would, I was a little disappointed that it wasn't like a genuine, like ten-year-old girl, but. I can ex- I can accept a computer or like hologram image. It works better for the theme. Mm-hmm. But it's an interesting take, I-, I think, on the Christmas special because normally Christmas specials like they're trying to make it like all be about family and peace on earth and goodwill to all men and heaven forbid the birth of Jesus Christ, <laughs> uh, who was not born on Christmas. Uh, okay, I'm not going to talk about that anymore. Um, <laughs> But in this case, instead of like just hamming it up and using like a very traditional tale, like uh, a Christmas Carol, which would have been sad, or like the Grinch or something, you know, it's like his heart grows three sizes that day. They just said, "Well, why don't we just like show you how horrible and meaningless all this consumerism is?" 
Yes. By by cynically exploiting that for other consumers purposes. As Ian has said, usually you'd get a heartwarming resolution by the magic of Christmas brings the family together. Here, not the case. The uh, Aunt Angelica leaves on a plane. Uh, Aunt Agatha, like, tells her nephew to step aside so she can murder a man. And calls him a pussy. And calls him a pussy, yes. Um, So she can murder a man and doom the city without listening to him. And I like how Cass just kind of resigns himself to it. Because at the end, when the demon pops like a champagne bottle and pink water starts flooding everything, he just kind of closes his eyes and looks really peaceful rather than, like, surprised or shocked and tries to fight it. Yeah. He certainly gets worn down in this tale, but we have to remember that all of this is just a story told by the old woman that happens to live inside his robot butler whose voice gets modulated to sound like Jude Law. Yeah. And I'm not sure what that makes it, then. (laughs) Well, I mean, Charles certainly did a good job of channeling Aunt Agatha, who was just mistreating Kaz. (laughs) And and, and yet, we don't feel any sympathy for Kaz, because he's just the worst person. The 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 only good thing I can say about Kaz is he seems to stick to his friends and constantly give them positive feedback on their weird, uh, caprese... Uh, mozzarella martini drink idea. And that's another C tier subplot where they constantly try to market their uh, their brand. Well, look, at least they didn't try and shoehorn any field hockey into this <laughs> <laughs> movie special, whatever we want to call it. We did have uh, in the sales clerk apartment above his bed, there's a poster of Kaz and his field hockey team. That is the only reference yeah, to it, yeah. I guess. But yeah, I do like what they did with the character of uh, Herbert and, and his slavish kind of devotion to this popular system, even though they don't really know his name. And I think as Ian pointed out, me and him re-watched, both rewatched uh, most of the series. Uh, like the, the term Herb is thrown on it as an insult constantly. <laughs> like presumably like short for herbivore. Uh, mm. in the usual sort of anti-vegetarian slur. <laughs> but the, uh, like when, when I noticed that, like, hang on a minute, his name is Herbert. <laughs> uh, it just was like, it was just a great moment. That, that, that really paid off. And we, like when he asks Kaz that if he can choose a present for Secret Santa, like he gets all serious and kneels down and speaks like, quotation mark, oldie English. And he's like, Dost thou bestow upon me the responsibility of choosing a secret Santa present for your arch nemesis? Yeah, we only listen to the the English voices, but I imagine that if we listened to the Japanese voices, he would have had a, a samurai accent. <laughs> oh God, what is the Japanese dub of New Yokio like? <laughs> we don't know because we keep watching this one because it's just so mm-hmm. stupid. <laughs> well, I say we keep watching; we haven't watched it since this came out. What I really like about Herbert's like kind of narrative arc is that they didn't give him an out. He just gets driven further and further into this dedication that he has. And when he eventually gets fired by the company, his first thought is immediately to commit suicide yeah. <laughs> because he's so ingrained in this capitalist system. And I just, I doubt this is intentional commentary, but it reminds me of all of the, of all the, of the Japanese salary man who gets laid off by his company <laughs> after he's dedicated his life to it. And then he doesn't really have an out to more. That's a character that exists that I've seen so many times. So I thought it was kind of interesting to see that here as well. The show has like tried to give across this sort of like vaguely anti-consumerist message. Like it's somewhat of a parody, I guess. Mm-hmm. But I often thought that the show was like very ham-handed about how it was going off just by like having like Kaz be like so obsessed with a singer and like just, uh, she's like she must be good she sold a billion <laughs> records and I definitely felt that it came across better this time than the character of Helena St. Tessaro yeah Helena St. Tessaro who I thought was a bit too unsubtle I mean like the, not that this show is subtle but right <laughs> like but like in this case, like uh, you're you're you can kind of it's it's showing us rather than telling us. Whereas yeah. Helena Saint Tessera was a very tell character. Yeah, Helena always felt a bit kind of um, disingenuous to me in a way because as Cass says in episode one or two, it says you're still a rich girl living in an upper class apartment, and all of her protestations against the consumerism of the city all felt a bit hollow at times. Whereas here, through the character of Herbert, who is actually like a lower class citizen it just works so much better though i did like the i did like the the touch that 
even her resistance to consumerism, which was the fact that she refused to wear any fancy clothes and always just walked around in a hospital dress and some bandages on her head, has now been turned into a consumerist product because young women can now buy the Helena for $2,000 and it's just a hospital dress and some diamond encrusted bandages. Like, that's good commentary. The diamond bandages were, 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 a, were a separate item they needed to purchase. Then. Yes, yes, you're right. How do we feel about the uh, Arcangelo commentary? Because that was uh, kind of the freshest take in this of like um, people or capitalists reappropriating anti-consumerism as, uh, as a marketing ploy. Because mm-hmm. it happens a lot these days. I mean, I liked how he sat on this kind of Infowars desk to give his podcast and talk about how if, if you really hate consumerism, you should buy tickets to his new concert. And it was so expensive too. <laughs> but like he must have been planning for ages because you could because you couldn't have just like come up with that special all all along. So you mean like this was like a long term plan, which I was like I was really happy with. Um yeah, I agree that it was the it, it was a reasonably fresh take. Um at least for 2018. At least yeah. I feel that it was a little too. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure how I want to phrase this. A kind of a little too easy for him. The fact that he just started, he well, well, I mean, I guess this is a, a common thing, right? It's just like he just turned around, he looked in the camera, he gave his little speech, and then everyone's mind has changed, which is an, in itself like a very typical thing that you would see at like in like a Christmas special. The like I learned something today of South Park, where it's just be like. <laughs> I learned that I don't need to have buy fancy things that make me happy. That's true. That's true. And here it's just used in reverse. But I think the reason why it works so well here is because again and again, we've been shown the slavish devotion the people of New York have to their top 10 bachelor celebrities. Yeah. So of course, when the number one bachelor on the bachelor ranking sport tells you fuck materialism, everybody gets on board with that. And I have no doubt that like a week or so after the, um, Christmas spectacular show that Angelo's put on, everything will just go back to normal, because yeah. in the long run, it's more pr- it'll be more profitable for him. Well, and of course, this is a fictional story all along. So, true, true. like, who, who, like, so, so, who knows, like, what's real and what's not? I do like that the final shot of uh, the specialist, him as Santa, because <laughs> I'm trying to make a comment about uh, Christmas specials in general. With that, who knows? I just adore the fact that he says "wink" without winking. At the end of the day, though, it's anti-capitalism is very, like, last year of high school (laughs) anti-capitalism. Yeah, it's, uh, like, I've been using the term sophomoric, which I get, which I guess is slightly more advanced than last year of high school, but, (laughs) or just, or just before, if you could take sophomore of high school, I guess. Uh, Regardless, uh, one of the things that I was sort of interested in is just how widely this show was panned (laughs) when it came out, because... We all enjoyed the show, I think. Yeah, um, yeah. Not just, not just well, the special. So it is true to say that you can pan something while enjoying it. <laughs> right, but it's it's like, for instance, I was reading like one review on Mal, and like they kept saying this, uh, they kept saying that like, it just has something like, kind of like, you kind of have to keep looking at it, like almost like a car crash or something. And I was just like reading this, it's like you're giving everything an F, except for the animation, which you gave a D. <laughs> and yet you still felt oddly compelled through the entire show. I was like, that's not F, my friend. That's you fighting against your inner nature that says it wants to that wants to like it. I mean, this is the problem with ratings, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, this is like I, I I hesitate to call like it's gonna be a cult classic, but I feel that like it's got the cult classic vibe to it. <laughs> also, there are a lot of people who like it for <laughs> the quote unquote themes, which eh. <laughs> I mean, its themes might not necessarily be my thing, but when I was rewatching the first three episodes earlier, it struck me with just how many quotable and kind of hilarious scenes there are in, in the span of three yeah. episodes. Like, there is a scene in episode one where he goes to his own grave bearing flowers. Then he lies down with his arms, with his hands folded in a prayer just to, to rest. And then he smells perfume, gets up and insults an old man's dead wife taste of perfume and tells her that you know she might enjoy a fresher taste and then he flies off on his robot butler to go to a party this isn't the only time he leaves his funeral to go enjoy himself 
because in the third episode, it's his grandfather's funeral that he's skipped to go to the park. I think that's four. Because episode three is the Hellenists. Ah, uh, okay. Sorry, you're right. It's, it must be episode four then, where uh, he just like doesn't go to his gra- he doesn't immediately go to his grandfather's funeral so that he can go to the park and just be melancholy and talk to his ex girlfriend, and then he goes there and then he like leaves town to go relax in the the uncle's house. I think a lot of people, one of the things they hate about it is just how Jaden Smith Kazkan is, and I thought that was the entire point the, yes. entire, the whole time. I, I feel like the main problem there comes from a disconnect between the visuals and the voice acting, because the Kaz we see on screen is so much more kind of emotional than Jaden Smith's deadpan delivery. It just doesn't really gel with how the character acts. But, it's really but that's what funny. makes it so funny. It is. It is. I, mean, I agree, but it's <laughs> like, is it, like the voice acting is an A plus tier because mm. we, like you say, we have this disconnect. Partly because although some of these people, like uh, Susan Sarandon and stuff, have done voice acting for other things, this isn't really what they do. Mm. Um, and well, they're they're just in it for like to get like big names. I think the, some of the choice. I think the choices weren't bad. I think I, mean, I think Richard Ayoade was perfect. Yes. <laughs> oh, I adore the fact that in the beginning of this special, they they reused the same voice line four times <laughs> rather than getting <laughs> it the same great. more than once. Oh, so real, good. real flashback to uh, old anime dubs. <laughs> like some other some other lines just from episodes one to three is win lose will all be equal in the grave. Two is the loneliest number, Charles, especially when you're second to a jackass. Swidding pasta. Well, that is the most melancholy of pasta. (laughs) While I'm gone, write a thousand words on the graceful geometry of the cable knit sweater. Why do people hate Jaden Smith again? I don't know. Just because he seems like a spoiled asshole, I think. Sure. It wasn't some bad movie. I feel I feel like I've seen people saying that this is like a Guy Fieri situation where everyone hates them, but they're actually okay. Well, that's the thing is, I I just don't care about him exactly. Yeah. But but like everything I hear about him is just that he's just kind of like a brat, and I'm like, okay, fine, fair enough. And I'm definitely getting the brat energy in Taz Camp, but I think it's <laughs> but, but whereas I usually find the brattier characters annoying, in this case, it just comes across as like so out of touch with reality that it's amusing. I, I also think it's hilarious that the, our character is such a massive asshole. And he's still kind of the, one of the least asshole persons in the show. <laughs> okay, okay, you need to justify mm. that. <laughs> this is more kind of speaking of the actual show um, than the special. Like, all the other kind of celebrities and bachelors we see, none of them are kind of willing to change in the slightest or even begin to recognize their their flaws. And while, while it happens very, very slowly and barely at all with Cass, there is a slight change with him. Uh, I mean, with Arcangelo... During the time when the the board is blown up, he tries to make peace with Kaz Khan, be, being like, well, when, when the board is gone, there are no East Side gentlemen and no <laughs> West Side gentlemen, <laughs> and starts and starts trying to get Kaz to call him a homie. <laughs> oh, that was yeah, also well, a plot point in this, where he, where, where he met Kaz and he's like, can you rap Kaz? It feels entirely like he's manipulating him for marketing purposes, though. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, that's true in this episode. I don't think it's really as true in episodes five and six of the show. Hmm. I, I think it's. I think it's just. I think it was just that, like, the thing that was giving them structure to their life is gone, yeah. and so it's just like, well, I guess we were we're work friends, <laughs> so we can be real friends. <laughs> Like his friends are less assholeish than him. I get his mother's definite, but his mother's definitely the biggest asshole. Well, in the his, show. Aunt, his aunt. His aunt. Oh, sorry, his aunt. Yes. And shout out to Susan Sarandon for the <laughs> second time on this she podcast. She just she just sits there in a trench coat and her sunglasses, and when asked if she's willing to do everything for money, she answers yes, like a good little capitalist. Well, the thing the, there's two things I love about her. One is just how much is just how much of an asshole she is to Kaz. <laughs> like, like she's just like good news, Kaz. You've got work on Christmas, <laughs> but also the fact that she is always wearing a trench coat and sunglasses, yes. and that's just amazing. She she just looks like she's a criminal, <laughs> and she probably is a criminal. But yeah, like I don't really think of uh, the sales clerk um, as being an asshole either. 
I don't really no, no, think that... Helena and Tessero or anything was being an asshole. I think that only his aunt is really uh, his aunt and maybe the other most eligible bachelors, I guess. Yeah, that, that's what I was saying. Like out of all the out of all the entitled assholes we see in the show, like he's the the only one who's kind of willing to start to change. He's still a massive asshole. There's a lot of shows that try and do this where the main character is an asshole and yet you're supposed to kind of like empathize and sympathize with them. So like <laughs> House is my go-to example. The early seasons of BoJack Horseman, which was the reason I didn't like it. Rick from Rick and Morty is the uber example of the modern era. And I hate that because we're now sympathizing with people who are like just sort of, who are just terrible. Like, it's like, no, no, like it's okay. They're right. Therefore, it's okay that they're an asshole. Hmm. Whereas I'd never felt this way about Kaz. I always felt that although he was trying to present himself as cool and suave and sophisticated, he was just ridiculous. Yes. He feel he feels like a poor kid who's never had gotten a reality check or anything because he's always succeeded in life at whatever he kind of wants, and all of his obstacles are just meaningless things such as oh he doesn't he isn't he's wearing a midnight blue suit to a black and white gala, like he doesn't really have real problems. No, absolutely not. I mean, he does have a job. He does have a difficult job, but he doesn't have real problems <laughs> outside of his job. And I guess this is why the story, the the story that we watched, was framed as a bedtime story about him told to him yeah. by his robot butler. And also, for some reason, seems like a kind of meta response to the uh, reaction to the first season. Because the point that they leave off on is Kaz being like, what the hell was that? I guess I liked the Toblerone jokes. <laughs> <laughs> but then you just destroyed me. But then you just destroyed Neo Yokio at the end. And then the butler's like, well, was it destroyed or was it restored? And he's like, well, I, I, I don't know. Why did you have to leave it so... Um, why did you have to leave it so ambiguous? And, it's, and then he's just like, okay, no tech. And I'll add in more Toblerone jokes next time. Like, honestly, I've never seen any anime that is obsessed with Toblerone, except for this one, obviously. <laughs> but it, that, that wouldn't bother me as much if they, they didn't keep referring to it as luxury chocolate. <laughs> like, it's fine. I'll, I'll eat a Toblerone if I'm given one. But luxury chocolate eating... <laughs> it is quite expensive. It's it's more expensive than, like, your regular chocolate, but we're not, we're not in luxury goods. I'm not going to a chocolatier to get Toblerone. <laughs> I'm going to the airport to get Turtler. That's true. Oh. Yeah, I guess the thing I don't get is just kind of why this got such a bad rap. Like, I, I, like I, Mal and uh, also Annie List didn't even bother including this because I guess, quote unquote, it's not anime. But I read a bunch of reviews and they were all just sort of awful. And I was like, ah, <laughs> I don't like it. But then again, I also really enjoyed The Room. And <laughs> other quote-unquote so bad it's good things and i just think that when you do something that it, that is so like its view of itself is so at odds with the reality and yet they've taken it so seriously this always leads to like a sort of a hilarious outcome and in this case i thought it, i like i i actually do enjoy the show maybe that maybe that was true of the original show i don't think this christmas special was made with without an awareness of um, what people's reactions would be. Yeah, I guess if I were going to like say one thing about the, the Christmas episode is that I don't know that it would stand alone. No. I think that it relies on you having knowledge of the characters certainly, and their certainly. dynamics. Yes. And so while I think, for me, you should watch this, uh, you probably should have watched at least one episode, and maybe watch all of it, because it's, 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 only, it's only six 20-minute uh, like episodes. So it's about three hours total, including the film. And it's entirely worth it. It's, uh, I think it's worth it. Just content warning, episode three is a little transphobic. Uh, episode four? Uh, but on the other hand, he does get called out for it because, uh, Lexi, because Lexi has like learned some things about being woke from being in a woman's body. Uh, Shout out to Lexi. Mm. They're the <laughs> like, actually, no, well, no, 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 no. Richard Ayoade as Herbert is the best character. Yes. But, but Gottlieb and Lexi are like the next ones up after that. Whereas our main character is like the fifth best character or something. <laughs> <laughs> so in conclusion, I think we have to ask ourselves, does this anime deserve that big Toblerone? And I say yes. Yes, it does. Yes, but it will be sick on it and that's entirely appropriate. Yeah. <laughs>
Ooh, I do have a piece of trivia for you before we leave off. When I was reading the interviews, Kerning and Smith were asked which people they wanted this series to be seen the most by. And Kerning answered, Hugh Laurie. Now, I, I understand why he said so, because Stephen Fry is in this series. And, and if they're saying it's based on uh, Jeeves and Wooster, then obviously they like a Hugh Laurie a lot. Mm-hmm. We all like Hugh Laurie a lot. Yeah. I, ho- I hope he I hope he has a happy holiday. And I hope you have a happy <laughs> holiday too, listen. Yeah. Whichever one you are using. Though I do like the just like the image of Hugh Laurie sitting down in his whatever apartment he has watching Neo Yokio and wondering what the hell this is. <laughs> then he calls up Stephen Fry, he's like, Stephen, what the hell, man? Stephen, why were you in this? And then Stephen reminds him that he was in the 101 Dalmatians movie. And then he goes, and, oh yeah. And, and, and Tomorrowland. <laughs> and Tomorrowland. Okay, all right. Hmm. We're the Anime Research Group, a weekly podcast coming out every Thursday. But not next week. We're on a break until January. So why not listen to one of our older episodes? If you'd like to tell us what you thought of the show or suggest something for future episodes, you can follow us on Twitter at research underscore anime or drop us an email at researchanime at gmail.com. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Goodbye. Goodbye.